Hi, good evening, and welcome back to our Adulting 101 series. Uh, tonight, we have uh, Janine Marin, Dr. Janine Marin. Uh, she is a clinical specialist and community educator from West Bergen Mental Health Care, and she is back tonight to talk to us about the stress factor, transitioning to college, and all that fun stuff. So I will leave it to you to take it away. Um, if you have any questions, folks, please know that we will answer them towards the end. Um, if not, we will share um, Dr. Marin's email towards the end of the presentation. And this will be recorded. So if you miss a little bit of it and would like to rewatch it later on, um, it will be available to you a couple of days after the recording. So take it away, Dr. Marin. Thank you. Okay, so everybody can see my screen, hopefully, yes. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about, um, in December, we talked about all the transitions and skills that kind of need to be built up um, to increase one's independence if you're going off to college or maybe you're transitioning from college to grad school or out to your own apartment um, or just trying to increase your sense of autonomy. Um, within your own home as a late teen, um, young adult uh, transitioning kind of into adulthood, later adulthood in your life. So this kind of follows that in that all those changes that we talked about creates a lot of stress. So this particular presentation is how do you handle stress? Now it does, says, it does say here the stress factor in building resilience before transitioning to college. But these stress um, tactics really can be used anytime. So, um, oops, I don't know why I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not, oh, there we go. All right, folks, I do apologize, but my system is not allowing the, I'm gonna have to change the share for a minute, hold on. All right, just give me a minute. I just tested this and it was fine. Okay, so hopefully now everyone can see um, this slide. All right. Okay, so um, when you look at this particular picture, hopefully it conjures a sense of calm and peace and actually it isn't stressful for you. Um, and that's because of many factors. If we were live in a group, I would ask you guys to kind of give me some input as to what those factors are. So for this one, um, you know, it's things like the colors, you know, they're very soft colors. It's also things like the content, the water, the water is very calm, the sun seems to be setting, um, sun implies warmth. So there's a lot of kind of calming features to this type of picture versus this kind of picture, which can be very arousing and kind of, um, um, get someone um, more of an impression of chaos. And actually that's what I Googled to get this picture was the term chaos. I think this might actually be from a video game. Some of you can be familiar with that game. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, what we want is to um, be in a calm place even when we're stressed or try to be or achieve to get back to this kind of calm um, place um, rather than uh, go to chaos, which actually some people um, use video games and things that are more um, kind of arousing to their brain um, when they're trying to de-stress. And I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight why that might not be the best option for you to do. Um, so to plan for success, there's three R's to stress we're going to review tonight. That's our goal. The first is to recognize what is stress and um, how does it impact me? Um, yeah, I guess see if I can get this slideshow. Okay. Um, the other one is um, basically uh, how to reduce stress. So when stress does occur, how do we reduce it and the impact that it has on us? Um, and the third R is to relieve it because sometimes even if we reduce 
um, the occurrence of it, we can kind of um, avoid some stressors or reduce the occurrence or the impact. Um, we often are impacted whether we like it or not. Um, so an example would be um, many of us for 10 months have been impacted by this COVID-19 um, um, changing our lives. So when we are impacted, whether we can help it or not, um, how do we relieve that stress? What are some additional stress busting and strategies and tools to use? So the two last R's, reduce and relieve, kind of go together. It's a bunch of strategies I'm going to talk about tonight. So stress, what is it? Basically, stress is um, change. It is any time we experience some kind of change, we experience stress. Um, and that change could be a positive change or a negative change or a neutral kind of thing, something maybe you don't have any emotional uh, negativity or positivity towards. But anytime something in life changes, um, that creates stress. So um, if you're planning um, a graduation, if you're planning to get your license, if you're planning a new job, um, you're going off to college, any of those things, while they're positive, they're still changes and they still um, involve a significant amount of stress. So there are different types of stress. We have um, use stress um, and distress. Distress is created by changes or stressors that we perceive as negative. Um, or are often associated with challenging life events, where you stress is stress created by welcome changes, um, by goals that we're like trying to achieve, things we're going after in life. Um, and they're associated usually with more positive life events. And then there's this kind of stress that sometimes is talked about um, by Yerkes and Dotson that um, they set up the model originally where there's stress that can um, actually impact motivation and performance. And the idea that Yerkes and Dotson um, focused on was that as um, someone increases their kind of uh, stress level, their challenge, their arousal, and this is usually with good stress, your performance will go up. So if you're worried about how you're going to perform on a test, um, you know, you have a little stress over that, you're going to study. So you're going to do a little bit better. Um, you know, if you're worried about passing a driver's license um, exam, you're going to practice and you're going to do a little better. Um, if you're in the playoffs for, you know, a sport, you're, again, you're going to practice, you're going to focus on, you know, what are the strengths and challenges of the other team, you're going to put in, you're going to be motivated to put in energy to increase your performance. But they also realize that there's a certain plateau that that can kind of operate for. And then eventually, if you have too much stress, too much arousal, that your performance is going to go back down. And that's the, um, the actual curve here. Um, and the zone we want to be in is right here, that optimal level of stress. Um, when we're talking about motivational performance related stress, um, that's the zone you want to be in before you go over the peak and down to kind of being exhausted. Now, um, you know, a lot of us have many different types of stressors. So one thing that I do ask you to do, and I know we don't have time here to have you all pause and do this and stop the presentation, but I'd like you to do this on your own, is to think about what are some of the common stressors or changes um, that you have in your life right now? And what are the ones you anticipate um, coming up? Uh, in your life in the next, let's say, month, the next uh, six months, the next year. Um, so think about those kind of changes and how you can best prepare yourself for them. Because again, any change, um, whether it's from our internal environment or our external environment, creates stress. So internally, changes inside of us, inside of our person, like our feelings, our expectations that we put on ourselves, our demands that we put on ourselves, maybe um, our fatigue state or our health illness state. Ooh, didn't mean to move her. Um, those things can all affect how we're feeling. Um, as opposed to external um, factors that can also be stressful. Let's say you get a call back for a play. Let's say, you know, you hit a lot of traffic, you're planning to graduate from college or high school, or maybe, you know, there's been a natural disaster or like there is right now, COVID. Um, so whenever those changes occur, whether it's a change within us or a change in our environment, our context, that creates stress, whether we like it or not. The bottom line just creates stress. Um, you know, sometimes that stress can be motivational and help us, and sometimes it can be something that can be um, hard for our uh, systems to adapt to, and it can be something that we need to really kind of help to have less experience with, or at least know how to deplete it when we experience it. 
Um, so stressors occur again, whenever we have changes inside or outside of us. And then those changes actually create another change. Um, but those changes that we experience, they're called stressors. And those stressors then create another change. They create actually um, changes in our brain and our body. And this happens automatically. We cannot help this. Um, you know, in the, in my past, I used to um, make a loud noise go off in the back of the room to make the point you can't help this so that people might jump. And then I realized, well, that's not right to keep stressing people that way. But to show you, it's an automatic thing. So think about that startle response you have when you suddenly see something or hear something you're not expected to, and you kind of draw up. That's a startle response that your brain automatically processes because of the change. Um, and that's always going to happen. That's the stress reaction. Now, some of these stressors, um, if they're significant or chronic or toxic or traumatic in nature, any of those factors and all of them um, can have stress affect us in the same way anxiety does. So it acts a lot, stress acts a lot like anxiety when it's significant, when it's chronic. So significant would be that it's, you know, something major, you know, going off to college um, or it's chronic, which the COVID um, you know, changes seem to be to some degree. 10 months is a long time. Um, it might be toxic or it could be traumatic. Any of those um, are actually um, going to act like anxiety. And when we're significantly stressed or when we're anxious, what happens is if you see here, all these lovely areas um, at the top of the brain, which are right under our skull, um, these are the areas of the brain that actually um, do all the higher processes that humans have. This temporal, the, the major four lobes, temporal uh, lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the frontal lobe. And what they do is they allow us to do everything from throw a football, um, know how to organize a closet, um, compose music, uh, use language, learn a second language, problem solve. In this area of your brain, right here, the frontal lobe, right behind your forehead, right kind of here, that's the most important area in terms of doing the most complex things. We call it executive functions. And I'm going to touch on this again in um, this part of the brain again when we talk about um, mental health and wellness next time in February because it's very much related to what's going on in teen and young adults and uh, in terms of mental health and wellness. That area of the brain is the last to develop. For males, it takes until about the age 30 to be fully developed and in females to, to late 20, similar range, um, as far as the data we have now. Um, what it does is it actually helps organize um, everything else the rest of the brain does. It anticipates things, it problem solves, it makes judgment, it allows us to kind of understand wit and humor at a higher level. Um, it does so many amazing things in terms of organizational skills, things like that. It's kind of our administrator, our, our, our CEO of, of the rest of our brain. Now that part, you know, being able to think through a problem, being able to know like, what do I do during this stressor? It's so important. Um, to have that kind of um, part of your brain operating and fully functioning when you're stressed. But here's the news, it, that's not gonna happen because when you're stressed, that automatic processing, what happens um, is the lower regions of your brain get more activated than the higher regions. These regions get tamped down. They're, they're not as accessible. I mean, they're not totally offline, but they're, they're tamped down. Um, you know, the, the bulb is dimming. Um, on those, while the lower area of your brain, sometimes um, stress and trauma therapists like myself refer to this as um, the reptilian part of our brain. It's not really reptilian, but we act like it's kind of reptilian in the way it acts. It's the part of our brain that helps us just survive, to stay alive. And um, so that lower region of the brain gets activated um, when we are stressed. And what happens is our blood pressure goes up, our breathing gets very shallow, we breathe from our upper chest, our brain gets, there's, there's chemical changes to our brain, and if it's prolonged stress, the, the cortisol that washes our brain can stay and can be a very harmful um, chemical for our brain to experience. Um, our pulse goes up, our digestive system kind of shuts down because we don't really need to digest. But afterwards, people may feel, um, or with prolonged stress, not feel so well. So a lot of times people have complaints because the blood pressure changes, the digestive changes, things like that. 
of headaches and um, stomach aches and things like that when they're stressed. Um, so what does that mean functionally? Um, you know, in terms of your body, uh, you get increased muscle tension, heart rate, that shallow respiration I, I mentioned, your blood pressure goes up and the blood vessels constrict, but you don't want that to happen for too long because all these things affect your health in the long run. Uh, your adrenal gland um, starts to release these stress hormones. And we go into what's called the fight, flight, or um, freeze mode. Now, many of you are probably familiar with fight or flight, um, but probably, I think, um, in more recent years, freeze has been spoken of more often, but a lot of people kind of forget about it. And it's actually the most, one of the most common um, stress responses in teens, adults, and, and humans in general. So um, the reptilian response from that lower area of the brain, when you're stressed, basically is like, I got to survive. So what do I have to do to survive? I got to protect myself. I have to protect myself. So that means I either have to fight. Now it's not always like, it's not like fighting with your fist, like the picture is. Fighting can be um, yelling. It can be slamming a door. Some people can fight with one look of their eyes, you know, sideways to someone. So fighting comes in many forms. So that's one way we try to deal with the stress. Another is to flight. And that's to like leave the, the stressor or to leave whatever is stressing you or making you anxious. And that isn't, again, always running away. It could be, but it might be, oh, I don't feel well enough to go to school. Can't imagine how many households this morning when school break was over had um, students who uh, said that they were sick when maybe they were just stressed about returning um, to school. So um, flight, you know, calling out sick, leaving early, um, not really showing up for things. That's a way of responding to stressors in terms of flight mode. Freeze mode is where you don't move. You literally freeze. You may still be there and people may not notice that you're stressed because you're frozen inside. You're frozen in thinking about the stressor or about how to get away from the stressor or how to calm yourself. Your brain is in yesterday. It's kind of thinking about, oh, you know, what, what happened, you know, yesterday, I can't believe I made that mistake. Or maybe it's worried about tomorrow. It's frozen in relation to that stressor, it's frozen. So you tend to be very quiet, almost not moving. So you think of like um, the, the tur a turtle, when a turtle's like inside its shell, that would be the frozen mode. And the fight mode would be like a snapping turtle. And then the flight mode, I don't have a good one for that because turtles aren't, aren't smart. So I don't have a good analogy with the turtle. Um, but what you want to be is a nice, you know, out of your shell, free swimming turtle, basically. And that's what we're focusing on tonight. So what happens um, functionally in our minds when all this is going on in our brains and our body? It's that our perceptions can become distorted and it becomes very, very hard for us to learn new things, for us to take in new information because those higher cortical regions are tamped down. Um, our attention and concentration is not as good as it should be. Our memory is not as good. We may, some people may worry. Um, we call that ruminating when it gets excessive. Um, not everybody does, but many people will worry excessively. Um, problem solving and coping becomes very compromised. What uh, strategies you used to use to cope can just kind of go out the window um, when you're stressed. And as a result, you'll even see a change in effect in your mood. There'll be fluctuations in your mood. Um, so, you know, like this little cute moment of um, uh, how to handle, how to handle anger when it comes up as a mood in response to stressors. Um, you know, when anger is someone it helps to just sit down and think about the problem. Yes, but not on someone else. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit specific to college and then go into the particular um, issues uh, or strategies, sorry, uh, for um, reducing and relieving stress. But if, you're if you are college bound or, or going to leave your home or going on something that's really significant change in your house, try to think again, when you have time on your own, what are those significant life changes that you're going to encounter? And also think of, consider like, what are your parents or your family going through? I, I have this little uh, cartoon. It's about, you know, a mom having uh, trouble letting go. So be aware of that. Maybe that first, you know, month of school, your parents going to call you two times a day or text you three times a day. Um, you know, you need to kind of anticipate that it's going to, you know, these changes stress everyone in the family, even though they're positive changes, again. 
Um, but if you're college bound, you need to think about all the life changes that are gonna occur for you. Um, and some different areas to think about is all the stuff we went over in December, and I understand that's available online through the Ridgewood Library, things like the increased responsibility in terms of money management, time management, all the organizational skills, your meals, your, you know, you're going to be exposed to more alcohol and substances, um, managing your space in your room and your shared space, dealing with the upkeep of your personal items, all those kinds of things. Also, you're going to need to think about how your social connections are going to be. They're going to change. You know, communication, you know, focusing also thinking about the tech sphere versus the here and now. How to manage your social media and digital footprint. There's a, a kind of phenomenon when students often go off um, to live somewhere, you know, either at college or in their own first place where um, before they kind of meet a lot of people and really connect, they tend to um, rely a lot on social media to stay connected. And, you know, be aware, we always put our best kind of footprint out there. We always, people like to put like, oh, everything's going great out there. It's not necessarily a, a realistic picture of what's going on with your peers. So be aware of that because that can actually um, add to the stress when students first go off to school. Um, there's also changes in your existing interpersonal relationships. You may have increased exposure to interpersonal aggression or violence or hostility. Um, and you're going to be handling very strong emotions all on your own. Um, so then there's also um, being homesick, you know, how um, stressful being away from that family, that comfort zone, your neighborhood, your past friends and connections, that can also be a stressor in and of itself. And then being responsible for making those important life decisions um, can also have an effect. So while we are stressed, we always want to think of this motto, oh, keep calm and carry on, everything will be all right. That's what we think. And that's the kind of message that we often project to people that we expect. But in reality, it's this, it's um, who are we kidding? Uh, we have to stay alive and avoid the, the zombies. That's what our lower brain is saying. So a little bit more about stress before we get to the strategies. Um, stress can, how much stress affects us can um, in part be affected by different factors. And I don't have all of them here, but I have some of the major ones. So the severity, is this a mild stressor? Is it a moderate stressor? Is it a severe stressor? That can make a difference. And what perception makes a difference here? Because what I perceive as mild, someone else might perceive as severe or vice versa, right? So we all, our own perceptions will influence how we perceive a stressor. Um, then how often or how frequently and how long of duration um, the stressor lasts can also have an impact. So is it rarely gonna happen? Because you know what, we spend a lot of time worrying about things that are rarely going to happen, if ever. Um, is it something that maybe only happens sometimes? Is it something that is likely to happen? Or is it just kind of random and you couldn't predict? Um, so those are factors that can affect you as well and can affect the way stress affects you as well. Um, then there's, um, is this something that's gonna be brief and it's gonna be over with, or is it something that's gonna be chronic? So I'll give you an example, you know, an illness that's chronic can be stressful for a very, very long time. Um, something like having to um, move into your new dorm room, that's going to be something that's brief. Um, other things that, you know, and keep in mind that even if something's long term, it doesn't mean that it's going to be negative. So for instance, if someone maybe got a new puppy in this past year, realizes that that means a lot less sleep for you um, and a lot more attention to the dog's needs than to your own. So and that seems chronic because it goes on for a while, but the puppy does eventually mature and you get to the point where, you know, it's actually seems like it was more an acute, you know, part of that, per, that uh, pet's life. The other thing that's important in terms of influencing how, effect, how stress affects us is whether it's predictable or not. So something might be totally unpredictable. It might be somewhat predictable or it could be thoroughly predictable. Um, and the stressors that aren't predictable, that kind of happen out of the blue, um, if they're severe, 
um, that can really be a huge stressor uh, in terms of impact on individuals. Um, but sometimes um, people, you know, things, people tend to worry a great deal about things from yesterday and things from tomorrow. I usually um, talk about Mark Twain here. He has this great quote about having known, you know, uh, I'm not going to get it exactly, but a great many troubles, um, but none of them ever happened. You know, hardly any, any of them ever happened. And that's because he was really commenting on this idea that we tend to um, predict what could be a stressor or a problem. And we spend a lot of time doing that. And that actually creates stress on us and um, can cause us to um, have negative effects from the stressors, which we're gonna learn about in a moment. Um, sometimes trying to anticipate what be, would be stressful, what's gonna change and what you have to prepare for is the great thing to do. It's really helpful. It's going to help reduce the impact of that stress. However, sometimes if we worry about everything that might happen, that's too many worries. That's too much stress on you. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're going to anticipate and cope ahead, make sure you choose which things you're gonna um, cope ahead for wisely because you can actually stress your brain by just trying to set yourself up to be prepared for everything. Um, so an example would be, I don't know, this is a grainy picture. I'm not sure how well you can tell what's going on here, but um, I took this actually from um, the top of the Empire State Building. Um, and it was very stormy, very bad weather. Um, it was cold February uh, date, and it was like a rain sleet kind of mix uh, going on. And right here are all um, these ferries that rush to this in the middle. That is the plane that um, Captain Sully, uh, some of you may have seen the film, um, left the, one of the New York City airports um, with a plane full of passengers and within minutes of being up in the air, um, hit, unfortunately, birds, flocks of birds um, hit their engines, both engines, very unusual to lose all engines um, at one time. And so they tried to um, get Captain Sully to be able to land in New Jersey, um, but he wasn't able to. Uh, and so he had to very quickly in a high stress situation, get that plane landed as safely as possible. Now he's over a major city. So what does he do? He lands it in the river. And what people don't realize as these ferries were, had already ushered over and gotten the people off because the plane's sinking there, um, he then calmly got the passengers from the plane um, onto the wings of the plane where they were picked up by these ferry boats. These are commuting ferry boats that go across the river, you know, um, regularly. And they saw what was going on and, and, and rushed to help. Unfortunately, it worked. They were able to get these people off these wings. Now, meanwhile, what people don't realize, and I had a bird's eye view of, was the plane was moving down the river in a current and sinking as he was getting all these people off. And he was extremely successful. There were no deaths in this very near tragedy. Um, and a lot of that had to do with um, how he responded to a very unpredictable, very sudden, and very severe stressor. And when people looked further into his life, what they learned was this is a man who consistently um, engaged in the kinds of things we're gonna talk about tonight that build wellness, and we're gonna talk a little bit about next time too, that build wellness, um, that reduces stress. So he was always working on his own self-regulation, his ability to do that. Um, so his ability to kind of get everybody off safely was remarkable, but, but also the passengers were really lucky that they had a man like him um, being the pilot. So again, you know, this little comic here, chill out people, I'm handling it. That's what we want to think. But the bottom line is how do, you know, we don't always handle stress as well as we think we do. So how do we cope with stress and how do we strengthen our overall mental wellness in general? That's the next thing we're going to focus on. So the first thing I want to suggest to you is please remember, no matter what you're going through, no matter what, maybe you're homesick, uh, you know, two weeks into to college, or um, maybe that first job doesn't work out, whatever it is, whatever you're going through, it isn't going to last forever. Okay. Um, and even if it is something that's going to last, our brains and bodies are actually built to go back to baseline, to go back to neutral. Um, so whatever is going on, that stressor, 
we are designed to recover. You, the human brain and body are amazing. We are designed to recover, to go back to neutrality. Um, so keep that in mind while you're going through the stressor, if you're feeling overwhelmed ever. Um, the other thing is, is that we can actually, the good news is we can actually intentionally help that process of getting back to, to kind of baseline of getting our brains and our bodies out of that fight, flight, freeze reptilian area and back into our cortical regions. And so here are some of the ways to do that. So now this is where we're going to really focus on, um, you know, how to reduce um, and how to relieve uh, stress. And when we want to do that, there's two more R's involved, okay? So in, when we're talking about reducing and relieving stress, two main things that work consistently, um, you know, throughout lifetime. So the first is to reach out, connection. Be connected to others, reaching out. That is first and foremost, a primary way of reducing stress, having social relationships. I know that right now it's really hard to get together with um, a lot of people, some people, you know, who aren't able to see loved ones and kind of hug and things like that right now. Um, it makes it really hard because actually hugging, touching of any type releases good um, neurotransmitters in the brain that actually help wipe out that bad cortisol that I mentioned earlier. Um, so reaching out doesn't have to just be by phone or communicating by talking, but even being able to have someone kind of, you know, put their arm around you, put your, their hand on your shoulder, that actually creates a change in our brains that helps to reduce stress instantly like that. Um, so that's the first R, the really important first R is to reach out and connect to people. The other one is to uh, regulate, okay, to regulate because what happens, stress dysregulates you. Okay. So what you need to do is dysregulate your body and your brain in all the ways I talked about earlier by changing your, um, your where your brain is, is amped up down in that lower region um, and, and tamping down the top parts of your brain, the cortical regions. And it's also um, dysregulating your body, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing, everything that's going on. So you need to re-regulate your brain and your body when you're stressed. And here's some keys to do that. Uh, here's a little bit more explanation of what actual regulation is. So you want to self-regulate. When you're born, when we're born and we're infants, we have no, we have very little self-regulation, very little. We have some, but very little. Um, and so um, we cry and an adult comes and takes care of us, feeds us, changes us, makes us warmer, or cooler, whatever we need. So that our regulation at that point um, in our lives when we're babies is actually um, by external control, by our loved ones, the people connected to us, right? And then as we grow up, part of, of aging and growing up is to develop the ability to regulate more for ourselves, to be able to control things from inside ourselves. So um, the example I like to use is to make pretend I'm sitting on a porch with, um, uh, two children, one is four years old and the other is 10. And the four-year-old, it's a very, very busy street, lots of cars going by fast. Both of these children know the golden rule is you never go near the street. However, as we're sitting there, their grandparent who's been in Florida for two years comes, you know, they see them coming around the corner um, and the four-year-old gets so excited about seeing their, their grandparents that they jump up and they run towards the street. And what do you do? You go and you have to run and control their regulation. They're dysregulated with excitement. So dysregulation can be positive. It can be with excitement too. Um, so you have to go and kind of re-regulate them. Nope, can't go on the road. You've got that, that particular rule. The 10-year-old, has a little bit more, you know, with age and development, a little bit more self-regulation capacity. And even with the excitement of seeing the grandparent does not, you know, jumps up and, and is screaming, you know, nah, nah, you know, um, getting very, very excited, but they don't run towards the road. They're regulated enough that they're able to kind of keep that like rule in their head, that safety um, idea in their head. However, they're not fully regulated yet because they knocked the four-year-old off the porch. So it's developmental in nature. The teen in that family group, by the way, is nowhere to be found. They're up in their room, they're over at their friends um, because they're much better at regulating. 
However, none of us are experts. It's developmental in nature, and it matches the development of this area of your brain, that frontal lobe I talked about. Um, so we do get better with age with regulating, but the good news again is we can learn how to regulate better. We can learn to respond, which is when we are agents, when we are in control um, and we are intentional about how we respond rather than have that knee jerk reaction. And I have these photos here to kind of reiterate that like a young toddler, we don't expect to have good regulation. Um, Sheldon, I don't know if you're familiar with that show, it's an older show now, uh, Big Bang Theory, we expect someone by his age to have a little bit more regulation than he demonstrates. And then this guy, it's just unrealistic. This adult, he's swimming with you know sharks all around him. That's just not realistic. Nobody can regulate that well. But what things will help you to regulate? Um, the kinds of things that help us to self-regulate tend to be things that are repetitive and rhythmic. Now, not all of them are, but a lot of things that are repetitive or rhythmic really can um, assist us in calming our bodies and brains and getting us back to um, being less stressed. So why do people pace? Why do people click a pen? Things like that. Um, it's repetitive and rhythmic. It may indicate that there's a stress at the time. Some of these strategies, though, involve more creativity. Some are more sensory-based, some are more body-based, some are a, a kind of a mix of um, uh, the sensory and body-based, as well as what we call mindfulness. Mindfulness is how to focus on the here and now, the present. Because remember, I talked about how much we, when we're stressed or anxious, we worry about things in the past and about the future, and we're not in the present. The more we can stay in our present, um, the healthier we will be, the less stress uh, we will be. Okay, so what are some examples? I'm gonna go by, and again, these, these menus I'm gonna go over, these are just a sampling of ideas. There's so many more out there, but clearly movement. Movement is extremely important um, for self-regulating. Doing physical exercise regularly and planning for that, to plan that into your week um, is really important. So things like walking. Um, running, swimming, biking, any of those things, throwing a ball against the uh, wall even, um, any kind of gym routines. But all of the martial arts, the martial arts are really key for um, self-regulation. There's something about those particular movements that actually um, work well with rebalancing kind of the brain and the body in terms of de-stressing. So consider things like Qigong and Tai Chi, um, karate, things like that. So any kind of movement. And then we have actual stress reducing strategies called relaxation techniques. The first um, would be to learn how to do different breathing techniques. Sometimes we can change our breathing to increase our energy, but when we're stressed, we usually wanna change our breathing to calm our bodies and brains. And um, I'll show you a couple strategies on the next slide of how to do that. And then you might want to match the breathing with some kind of guided imagery. With guided imagery, what you do is you kind of create a place that you really, really like, hopefully in nature. Um, this picture on this slide is actually from the top of a mountain in the Adirondacks looking out um, onto another lake. Um, so this, uh, you know, kind of um, getting out, this is a, a great way to, um, to de-stress is to... Um, exercise on a hike, take a picture that you can use to maybe have as a de-stressor when you're back, and then even visualize yourself being there when you're in a stressful situation. So maybe you're waiting in a doctor's uh, office or something, or you're waiting on, on the line for class registration and you heard your class is getting full and you're stressing a little bit. You could visualize yourself being there. But in guided imagery, make sure that you really see yourself there and then you focus on your senses. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What is it like to have like the tree on my back that I'm sitting against? What's that feel like? Am I smelling anything? Does the air taste like anything? And focus on all the, the kind of senses um, for being there and really just kind of sit there and let yourself um, be there for like 10 minutes and make sure that it's perfect. So if you choose the beach, you don't want sand flies. It has to be a perfect place that you're visualizing in your guided imagery. Another technique is called muscle relaxation. So this is where you would tighten your, your uh, parts of your uh, 
your body and I'm going to demonstrate because you can see hopefully my hand up and you tighten, tighten, tighten until like your veins are popping out, right? And then you hold it, hold it. You're going to hold it longer than I am right now, but I'm going to have to let go so I can continue, but, and it will be a little tingly or maybe just like feel like really like air. With that kind of strategy, what you want to do, and this is a great one if you have trouble getting to sleep to do, um, and this is one that really reduces stress effect if you practice it ahead of time, because it's not as good at relieving if you've never done it before. Some of these you have to practice ahead of time in order for them to be effective to relieve stress when it's occurring. So what you would do is um, with progressive muscle relaxation is you could start at your toes and work your way up your body, or you could start at your head and work your way down your body. So you could squeeze your toes together, hold it for a minute and then release. Then your whole foot, your calves, your knees, your thighs, your buttocks, your stomach, your chest, your shoulders, your, you know, your lower back, sorry, your shoulders, um, your neck, and you can go down your arms to your hands and then come back to your neck and scrunch your face and your head. And some people like to combine that particular strategy with um, a visualization of maybe a light going down through the parts of the body or coming up through or some other kind of maybe music, something like that. So that's progressive muscle relaxation. If you use that strategy and practice it, you can get to the point where you can just kind of spot check. My stress is usually always in my lower neck, upper shoulder. So I'll be like, oh, that spot needs to be like tensed and released. So then you can do um, that kind of like spot check in, um, during the day or whenever to uh, relieve tension as well. Meditation, um, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness and meditation strategies in a little bit, but they also help to um, reduce stress. Now for the breathing, what you want to do is actually get the breath to get to your diaphragm. For kids, young kids, we call it belly breaths, but it's called diaphragmatic breathing. So you want to make sure that you're breathing in through your nose at a slow count. And, um, you know, one way to, to see if you're able to do this is to put your one hand on your belly and one hand on your chest. And when you breathe in, you're trying to get your hand on your belly to move. You could also try it if you're like horizontal, put a cell phone or something on your belly, see if it moves, something you know sizable that you can see while laying down, see if it moves or not. Your goal is to get the air into your diaphragm, into your belly area, get that hand to move because you don't want the air to just go shallow when you're stressed up here to your chest. Again, if you practice deep breathing, um, you'll be able to do this and calm yourself pretty quickly in a stressful situation. If you're using it for the first time in a stressful situation, don't expect it to work as well as it could. Um, a lot of athletes um, and singers and actors use these strategies to help build um, the skills that they need to be good performers. Um, but we can use these skills to actually help us to de-stress. Um, so you want to, there's a number of, of different ways to do this. One is to start by inhaling through your nose um, and you would go, you kind of would expel all your breath and then you would go inhale and then count two, three, four. So over that time and go a little slower, I kind of did that fast. You're inhaling to that rate, inhale, two, three, four, and then you'd hold two, and then exhale, two, three, four. You also want to exhale very slowly because you're going to have that kind of urge when you're first practicing this to just push the air out and that's not helpful. You want to get that air down into your belly and you repeat it a couple of times and then take a break because you don't want to hyperventilate. Um, and eventually when you get good at like the count that I just did, like four in, hold for two and four out, you start to want, you want to start to increase the exhale to the point where you get double the inhale. So maybe for you, it's like a three count in and a six out or a five in and a 10 out, but you want eventually to get to the point where the slow exhale is double the inhale. There's also this thing called four square breathing. Um, and uh, there's strategies to kind of breathe to increase your energy. Um, I'm going, there is a slide um, on the presentation that has different places to um, go to um, get videos or look at different versions of the breathing techniques. Um, okay, so other things that are rhythmic and repetitive, like I mentioned, um, 
earlier that can be very self-regulating, very helpful in um, getting us to de-stress and regulate, get our brains and bodies back to neutral are things like music. So, and it could be anything. It could be playing music, listening to music, dancing to music, um, composing music, you know, doing a drum circle, a, mu a, a sound bowl, all kinds of things, um, singing, anything musical because it is rhythmic and repetitive often, you know, music is. And so that can be very um, helpful in terms of de-stressing. Um, Art-based uh, activities as well. So drawing, um, there's a reason adult coloring came back into, you know, um, fashion um, years ago. It's because adults were stressed and adults realized that it's really calming to, to color, <laughs> you know. So drawing, sketching, um, coloring, collage making, mandalas are really, um, are really also puzzles, by the way, it's not art, but um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a puzzle um, of a mandala. Painting Play-Doh um, can be very helpful. So floam, uh, this, you know, kind of things to manipulate in your hand, um, sculpting, any kind of pottery, crafts, all those kinds of items, knitting, um, et cetera. All those things can be very self-regulating. Then there's the creative. Um, uh, methods of kind of increasing um, your higher cortical regions coming back online and decreasing your stress. Um, things like writing poetry, creating a song, uh, journaling, creating, you know, um, maybe a prose piece. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways, you know, maybe write a play and act out a play. Uh, drama strategies are very de-stressing. Um, and then there's everyday activities or tasks, things like cooking, chopping can be very self-regulating, um, gardening, breaking up things for the recycling, shredding paper, um, and even cleaning. Um, but the one thing that I think um, many youth, uh, many teens and young adults and, and adults, uh, older adults too, turn to when um, they're looking to de-stress is digital activity. We turn to binge watching TV shows, going on social media, looking at our phones, you know, somehow being on blue light on a screen our laptops, our phones, our TVs, whatever it can be. And actually blue light stimulates the brain more. And your whole goal when you're trying to de-stress is to reduce the brain's arousal, reduce the brain stimulation and get it back to kind of a neutral point. So we really do say, you know, it's best to stay away from digital activities if possible. That being said, there's also going to be um, at the end a page on some of the apps that can be helpful that are digital based. There are some great ones out there to help de-stress, um, you know, some that can guide you through the breathing or through meditations or through many different kinds of, um, some are little games that help you like you fill something with sand. It's very slow and soothing to do. So there's a lot of um, apps that, that can actually, if you're going to use the digital, um, platforms that can um, be more calming relative to um, some like that picture I showed at the beginning of the presentation with the, the video um, game of chaos. Um, another simple thing to do um, to reduce stress if you're basically going to maybe go in for an interview, have to talk to somebody about something hard. This is like if there's something that you're going to do that you want to feel um, competent at, like you have good self-esteem going into it. These techniques are very simple um, and they take two minutes. It's, you need to do them for two minutes, 120 seconds, but it's to do one of these poses at the top here. So this is a power seat. This is a power, you know, sitting position. This is the one I prefer. It's um, where you stand with your, your feet about hips width apart and you put your hands on your hips. That's all you have to do. Um, we adapt these for kids. If you have uh, younger siblings and stuff you want to share this with, you can make them like power poses. Oh, I keep forgetting it doesn't show when I go. Uh, you can do like Superman poses, things like that. Um, so these are all power poses. So holding one of those for take a couple deep breaths and then hold this position for two minutes actually train changes how effective you're perceived by others, how competent you feel, etc. And these studies were done by um, Amy Cuddy up at Harvard and people were like, well, that's just self-report. It doesn't really do anything. So they redid these studies and they actually saw 
stress hormones lower in people's physiological systems when they did these for two minutes. Um, so keep that in mind, these high power versus these low power. You don't want to do these beforehand, sit and fret like this. You want to be standing like, you know, I can do this. So it's, got, you know, really confident boosting and helps to reduce stress when you're approaching um, something that's going to be stressful. So this is a stress reducing strategy. Other things, mindfulness. Mindfulness I mentioned earlier. Mindfulness basically focuses on the here and now, getting your brain or your, your mind's eye to focus on here, not yesterday, not tomorrow, not later today. It's present centered awareness. Um, and so it could be just noticing and identifying um, your thoughts and your feelings or what's going on in your body at that moment. Now it's not always easy to stay very present focus, distractions happen. But what you do is you just bring yourself back to the present and try not to apply any judgment and just be curious about where your brain, you know, went and what it's like to kind of be in the present. So, you know, is your mind full of things like this man's is, right? It's all full of things. Or are you being mindful like the dog who's just seeing the scenery? But I bet the dog is like wanting to actually go and like sniff these things and be more engaged than, than it's letting on in that cartoon. Anyway, other ways to get, uh, to increase your mindfulness is to start with focusing on your senses. So one way to do that is to do like kind of five around. You do it right now, you could pause and just look around your room and see if you can identify like three things in the room that you didn't notice before. Every time I do this, I find a new like cobweb or something out of sorts in the room. So I'm gonna let you guys do that on your own and continue to talk, but um, see if you can find like three things in the room you didn't notice before, just using your eyes and focusing on your eyes. And then you could pause and be quiet for a moment and see if you can hear maybe two sounds you didn't hear before. For me, I just heard my clock ticking that I couldn't hear over my speaking. Some of you may hear the, the system, the engine of the system in the room that you're using, your computer, your laptop, or your phone. Um, so you would go through your each of your um, systems and see, you know, is there anything that, you know, what's it feel like how you're sitting? You know, are there any interesting smells? And if you're, you can do mindfulness eating as well, where you only focus on the taste, you quietly sit and eat your meal and only focus on the taste. Another way, great way to do mindfulness and taking and using your sensory based um, mindfulness activities is to take a walk in nature, um, to quietly go around and to take in all the things you see and you hear and um, what things feel like, if there's different smells, is there a taste to the air, anything like that. So other visual based ones, things that, um, you know, we tend to want to um, play all these kind of like highly um, electronic games, but some of the things that, that your parents' generation did when they were younger, when they played, um, or maybe that you played when you were a young child actually work to self-regulate us. So things like, um, you know, playing I spy games, like I spy this and someone having to figure out what it is, or you could play like hot and cold, but switch it up and use visual clues. So the, you hide something if the person's getting closer and you're, smi that you're smiling. If they're not, you're, you're kind of looking sad. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and then going for walks in a new space or nature walks, as I mentioned, and taking in art um, with, if you have younger siblings at home or you just like glittery things. You can make a your own snow globe in a glitter bottle kind of thing where you have a lot of glitter and you can shake it up and then you just watch it all settle down and that can be very uh, calming to do the watching. I would combine that with some deep breathing as well. Um, some other activities, you know, listening, going on the listening walks, doing a sound um, bell, um, trying to match sounds or pull out certain instruments in songs, doing a snap along, trying to repeat um, a sound that someone else made, their smells, you know, try to distinguish between two foods, blindfolded. I talked about mindfulness um, eating earlier, uh, but then also touch. You can kind of, um, a really kind of neat thing to do is to, without sight, but just by feel, reach into a bag of a bunch of objects and try to find a particular object 
or have someone put something in your hand and you have to guess what it is. And, you know, it's really hard to worry about yesterday or tomorrow when you're just focusing on that sense, on that particular sensory thing at that moment. Um, so, you know, and if all else fails, you can always pop bubbles. For wellness, make sure, you know, especially when you go away that, um, to school that you enjoy time for yourself, that you take breaks from those devices and that you're connecting with important social contacts face-to-face. -face. And then there's basic wellness, which I'm gonna go over some of this next time too, about nutrition and exercise, getting good sleep, um, spending time in nature with your pet, making sure you're laughing and having fun um, and connecting with others. Remember, we started with that. Um, being able to integrate um, you know, gratitude into your daily life, ex uh, actually expressing gratitude about three things every day um, has a significant impact on decreasing depression um, in individuals with clinical depression. So it's very helpful for people who are just stressed. Um, trying to be of service to others and part of your community can also um, really make a, a strong impact. Basically, these later ones are talking about building resilience resilience, which is the ability to bounce back after um, a stressor and to get your, your body and brain back to where it needs to be. Um, you know, and there's lots of different strategies that can regulate the body and mind. I'll probably bring some more uh, to the next uh, presentation, but I wanted to give you an introduction to some of these um, tonight. And, you know, just keep in mind that, again, perspective makes a difference. You know, sometimes we give the message that no matter what the item or task is, we should never give up. But you know what, is that the right message to be giving ourselves or to others? Because you know maybe some things aren't really um, worth continuing to stress ourselves over. Um, and certainly don't forget about practical tools, you know, checklists, um, you know, maybe um, setting timers, taking breaks, maybe you need earplugs. Um, having a plan B, there's lots of practical things uh, to keep in mind as well. Um, so that's what I wanted to present tonight. Um, you will see when I get the slides out, there is, um, as I said, I have to fix the positioning on that, but there's um, some relaxation or mindfulness related apps as promised, some references to look up more things and some resources and uh, websites if you're interested in any of the topics that I mentioned. So um, I'm really grateful you joined us. And remember, I'm just scratching the surface on all the types of strategies that are out there. Um, next time in February, I'm going to talk about um, mental health and wellness, um, especially how mental health um, is related to that brain development that I talked about um, and how um, being in the teen and young adult years um, is very important in terms of mental health um, and creating um, strategies to maintain good mental health for the rest of your lives. Um, so I hope this has been helpful and I'm available at jmarron, M-A-R-R-O-N at westbergen.org, um, which see. I don't know if, oh, I didn't have it. I don't think at the, I'm sorry, but this is how you spell my last name. It's J and then Marin, M-A-R-R-O-N at westbergen.org. If you have follow-up questions or anything, maybe you want me to specifically include in the, in the February program on um, mental health and wellness for teens and young adults. Thank you. So much, Dr. Marin. Again, I am sitting here listening, and it was, I feel like you hit, you touched on a lot of things. And sometimes, like, even as an adult myself, like, I forget to breathe, like, you know, just to like take five minutes and just take a breather. And this was, this was great. Thank you so much. Um, again, this will be uh, recorded and uploaded on our website. Um, any information uh, we will share our email address as well um, if you want to reach out and touch touch base with her personally. Thank you again, Dr. Marin. This was wonderful. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.